Cinema Draw is sponsored by Overcast, an independent podcast app that embraces the open world of podcasting instead of locking it down. No exclusives, no premium content, no paywalls. Just a great podcast app for everyone. Get it for free in the App Store. And we thank them for their support. Listening to Cinema Jaw, the greatest movies podcast ever, recorded on location from our respective homes in Chicago. My name is Matt Kay, and with me is Ride the Movie Guy. And this week on Cinema Jaw, Matt, you're not going to believe this, but I actually watched you create your top five list this week. Were you like hiding in the tree outside my window or something? I set up cameras last time I was there for uh, pizza. Oh, geez, I'm pretty sure that's illegal, buddy. <laughs> I kind of We're suspected doing- this about you. We're doing our top five voyeurism films, Matt. This is an interesting topic because I think voyeurism and movies is like peanut butter and jelly, right? Because the audience, to a certain degree, are always voyeurs. This is true. But when when the topic itself is explored within a film, it can open up some rich possibilities. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of heavy hitters uh, that Jawheads are probably thinking about right now when it comes to voyeurism films. But... I actually have a few on my list I have never talked about on Cinema Jaw before, so it's going to be a fun top five. Good. I'm glad you dug deep because I have some uh, surface level ones, as usual. And to help us with the top five, we have a great guest who's going to rejoin us. Yes, we do. Ryan Ostrike of the Music Box Theater is back. He's going to be talking to us all about the offerings currently happening at the Music Box Theater. It's exciting because I know a lot of people are anxious to get back to the movie theaters, and This is the guy we know. I mean, he's the general manager of the Music Box Theater. So he's an expert on making sure that people are safe and get back to the theater and can enjoy film in the cinema house again. Right. If there's one person to talk to who's a true expert, because a lot of movie theaters, they care about the popcorn. They care about the, you know, concession sales. The Music Box Theater actually cares about movies. This is the guy to talk to when it comes to theaters in Chicago. I agree. And people are probably wondering where the voyeurism ties into, and it ties into one of the reviews we have this week. That's right, Ryan. We will be reviewing The Rental, which is the tie-in, and First Cow, which is not a voyeurism movie. No, um, but it is out on VOD now. And in honor of First Cow, I thought it would be good for you to take Ryan on in first movie trivia. Think of movies with first in the title. Sound good? Sounds good. I can think of a couple. And it is the last week, I believe, that we will be celebrating the great Charlize Theron. So let's start with a Charlize fact. All right, Ryan. Charlize actually wanted to be a ballerina. She absolutely loved to dance and started to take ballet lessons when she was just four years old. Charlize wanted to pursue ballet and moved to New York to follow her dreams. She enrolled at the Joffrey Ballet School. Unfortunately, she suffered a knee injury that ended her ballet career. Hmm. It's interesting because usually I think of people in the ballet as being small, very, very much like Natalie Portman in Black Swan. And yeah. now Charlize is very tall, actually. I mean, I, I believe she's 5'10", tall right. for a ballerina, I think. She's definitely tall for a ballerina. I can see that she's got the coordination with all the action and the stunts that she does you know what, I'm kind of glad her ballet thing didn't work out because then we wouldn't have gotten Mad Max and Monster and all the great movies. Agree. And uh, yeah, it probably does help her with all those action scenes because she can move around with the best of them. She's very believable on screen when she's beating people up. All right, Matt, we ready to get this show on the road? Yes, sir. Without further ado, we bring in our guest. He is the general manager at the best movie theater in Chicago, the Music Box Theater. You guys have heard us talk about it many a times. Ryan Ostrike, welcome back to Cinema Jaw. Ryan, Matt, Jawheads, lovely to, to talk to all of you again, even in this weird COVID interruptus moment that we're all globally everywhere, whoever you are dealing with. Yeah, sure. It's good to talk to you. So we have been obviously still podcasting during the pandemic and we have guests on and we ask them, how are you doing the, during the pandemic? But you're a guest that when we ask are directly affected by the pandemic more so than probably any guest we've had on so far during this because obviously movie theaters everywhere 
completely shut down. So just go through that, that beginning moment when, when it all went to hell and, and you had to close the music box. Let's, and how, let's relive how heart, that, shall we? How heartbreaking that was. Go over that, that first before we get to the, the joyous return. Thank you for this. Um, yeah, it, it, um, it was March uh, 19th. Uh, it was Monday morning and we had already put in these restrictions and everything kind of was in place from the following week, knowing we had to like take this thing seriously, even if our government or people around us were not taking this thing seriously. And so even though we had done a lot to sort of restrict our business um, to try to, you know, manage this, this virus that was coming across the United States, it wasn't enough. And then so it was like Monday, March 19th or whatever, 17th, I don't remember the exact uh, date at the top of my head, but it was on that Monday where we were like, people are going to get closed down. If we don't choose to close down ourselves, we're going to get shut down. Um, it's worse than we thought it was. And so I, the, the thing we got to do right now is just for the public good, we got to close. And so we made the choice that we said, uh, hey, everybody who's coming tonight, if you have tickets, this is it. This is the last night we're going to be showing movies. We ended up, our last screening was a 70 millimeter screening of Toby Hooper's Life Force, which what a strange film to end on. Uh, yeah, um, it's a good movie though. No, yeah, very entertaining. Um, that crowd of 42 people had a, had an experience knowing also that it was going to be their last theatrical experience for a long time. It was not as tough of a decision as I thought it was going to be because we kind of had already planned for it. But I knew in my gut that it might be worse than I think it's going to be. Um, but I wasn't expecting it. And so when I was telling my staff and everybody that I was like, hey, we're just going to close down for a couple of weeks. You know, we'll take care of you. You'll you'll still be on payroll. We're, we're gonna figure this out. Don't worry, we got you. And my God, I was saying, how long can we you know, can we do this? Um, and I had no idea. So you know, when we closed down, we thought you know three four weeks and we would reopen, uh, and then it extended, and then we were like, okay, it's gonna be May first, and then it was like, okay, it's gonna be June first, and then it was just like it was like mid to late May, and I knew we weren't opening June first, and I said. I don't know when we're going to open. I, I don't know what the hell is going to happen. And so we had to do everything in that time to figure out how to survive and how to keep our, our, our staff on the payroll and keep paying them, keep supporting them. We wanted them to feel like they were still part of a business because um, we're, we're a team. You know, I care for every single one of those folks. So we did virtual cinema. We did concessions to go orders. We did a music box garage sale. I mean, we were just like figuring any way we could make money. We were doing this for a very long time and we had some cash reserves that we had kind of like put into the bank, you know, for other things like fixing seats or whatnot, because we're a 90 year old building. Um, but after a while it became too much. So we had to like lay off a bunch of folks, but that wasn't the end of the day. We, we held out a long time. You know, we kept just kind of pivoting and trying new things to make money. Um, even though like any money we brought in was like a fraction of what we would normally do. And so after a while it was like, okay, what are we going to do? We have to figure out how to like, you know, keep this thing going. And this was in June. And then we had this kind of window of opportunity where Chicago basically really got this virus under control in June. This is, this is June, this is not July. So if you live in Chicago and you're here listening to this now and you're like, Hey, I know what the numbers are today. Now we're talking June numbers when, when things are really, really good and really under control. And then so we saw a window and we thought, okay, maybe we're going to try to reopen, but let's do it in phases. We created garden movies, which is outdoors screenings in our lounge and garden space. And then we, we opened on July 3rd to, to uh, very reduced capacity. So it was a bumpy up and down three and a half months. But what we found is we have a lot of, uh, you know, really rabid, caring fans or customers who really wanted to help us in our in our time of need and we, they found different ways to do it whether they were buying merchandise or gift cards or renting movies online um through us or you know supporting us in other ways we, you know we kind of eked it out in our best our, our best way um just to get to the point of uh, this kind of soft slow reopening that we're doing currently sure so so let's go with one of the soft openings which is the garden movies for people outside of Chicago or haven't been to the music box, they have a lounge area and behind it has an outdoor seating area, which is great in the summer. It's like a beer um, garden. Yeah, like a beer garden. So how many people can go in there and watch a movie the way you have it set up and configured? 
So with the socially distanced, we can do up to 25. Uh, usually we do about 22, just because sometimes you get singles who come and it's hard to socially distance a single person from others. Like if there's, if it's like a pair, like a household, like twos, it's easier. But 20, 22, 23 people a show. We do it Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, nights at, at sunsets, like 8.30, 8.45. Uh, we kicked it off with Purple Rain. Just oh, nice. Prince music is brings people together yeah you know, all, all ch- types chicken of soup for the soul yeah um so that was the soft reopening was was that and then <laughs> july 3rd we we actually reopened and then but we when we reopened we kept garden movies going um mm. and we still have garden movies going but when we reopened we and and are still we have like really reduced capacities and limited show times so I, I understand that you have to buy your tickets beforehand. It's all online. And then are you assigned a seat or is it like certain areas that you can sit so that you're socially distant from someone like say me and Matt each had a ticket and we wanted to be, you know, 10 feet away from everybody. Is that basically how it works? That's usually how it works. You and me, I'd like to be 10 feet away in general. <laughs> well, glad to know the pandemic doesn't change anything for you two. Anywho, uh, about the theater, uh, yeah, of course, you buy your ticket, and it's not reserved seating. We could do reserved seating, but it's really complicated when you have 50 tickets that you can sell and 750 seats, <laughs> so it's really hard to do reserved seating in that way. So basically, what we've done is we've closed off entire rows, and, uh, and then inside the rows that are open, we've made them rows where basically four people could sit in the middle or two people on the ends. And then every other row is is closed off. So if you could imagine 750 seats chopped down to 150, you walk into the to the room and you're like, okay, I can't even sit in this entire row. And then these seats say close. So basically, and we have an usher walking around in case anybody doesn't read a sign, um, but most people do. So basically, you can't sit too close to somebody else. You just can't. And since it's only 50 people, um, we have certain wings and sections of the theater where if you were to sit in them, because nobody really sits in them, you could be 25, 30 feet, 35 feet away from the nearest person. That's awesome. And for listeners who have not been to the Music Box, this is a giant room. I mean, your main theater space, 750 seats. You can say that number, but I don't think people can really understand. Just it's, It used to be a, a stage, like a vaudeville stage, so it's got those high, high ceilings. It's just a very large, spacious place. So Yeah, so social distancing is not an issue. Um, and then it, even in our small theater, we're only allowing 16 seats of our 70. Even in that theater, we, we're socially distancing everybody six feet minimum. Basically, with, between both auditoriums, our capacity is massively, massively reduced. But that's the way we need to do it right now. Sure. Now, the other challenge uh, being a theater owner during this pandemic and the soft opening is what movies do you show, right? Because here you are now finally open and Hollywood, the studios, uh, don't want to release their movies quite yet. Um, We did get a a little bit of a gem that I know is playing currently at the Music Box and Open, uh, which is Relic, a movie we're reviewing this week, The Rental. But you're also tying that in with some classics, correct? So both of the movies you just mentioned – came out day and date, which as Jawheads probably know, day and date means you could rent it online or go to it in the theaters if, well, in the pandemic time that we're in, if a movie theater is even open. So that means that the only new product we have is not exclusively theatrical. And then all the other product is what we call repertory, which the Music Box is very well known for doing repertory programming. Um, but what we specifically wanted to kick off with was something that is so such a theatrical experience that you just can't, there's no parallels to watching these types of movies at home. So basically, we made our audience. We have a very large audience, and we surveyed them, and we got 2,200 responders. And we asked them, you know, when would they be comfortable to come back, in what format, or, you know, what things that they would need, you know, safety, security, you know, cleanliness, that sort of stuff. But we also asked them what they really like watching when they come to the music box. And 70 millimeter is something that was high on that list. And 70 millimeter was something that got interrupted. We decided we would reopen with 2001 A Space Odyssey on 70 millimeter. So again, 70 millimeter is the widest gauge format. It's the the most visual uh, rich that you can uh, watch a movie in. Plus the sound is just 
it's it's uh, it's loud and it's it's there. You just feel it. It's sound you feel, not just hear, um, because of the way that there's like five mill millimeters of, of of a soundtrack that the analog projector could read. So basically, what we came back with was a truly, truly, exclusively theatrical experience. Um, and we've been playing 70 million the whole time. So we 2001 Space Odyssey led into Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, which led into Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, which is leading into uh, Phantom Thread. So that's all going on in the main theater. And then in the small theater, we have newer films that you can also watch at home. Because another piece of it is we have customers who, a lot of customers, who are just not ready to come back to the theater yet. And we don't want anybody to feel like they have to, the only way to see a singular movie is to come into a movie theater. We want people to have that choice. And so that's why playing movies that were either day and date releases or what we call virtual cinema, which was a good way to program theater too. Basically, you could see it in the theater or you could stay at home and not worry about coming out. Yeah, I wanted to explore the virtual cinema really quickly. Like, how does that work? If I wanted to watch a movie uh, through and support the music box at home, how do I do it? Well, the virtual cinema was the greatest pivot that indie distributors could do for indie independent movie theaters, which is they create their own platform where you basically rent the movie online for like 12 bucks, which would be the cost of movie ticket, but you're probably watching with one or two other people, maybe just one, maybe two, it doesn't matter. And then 50% of that 12 bucks is actually going to the movie theater that you linked through to see it. Nice. Um, so basically for the music box, we just put up all these links of the, and we still curate it. So it's like three or four links a, a week that you can put on, we put on our website and we are like, Hey, these three movies are really good right this week. So if you're looking for something good to see, go here, you click the link, you pay the $12, uh, you watch the movie and then and, and the distributor kicks us a check when the run is over for 50% of those proceeds which is supporting us while we're closed down. So you get to watch good movies that the music box is saying, hey, watch these movies, which we'd be normally doing if we had the theater open and you're still supporting us. That's awesome. That is, that is a great way to support the uh, music box. And, and if you're at a, you know, a, another city somewhere that has a, a local cinema to, to, do, to the same. I was so upset that I was out at my dad's when you guys had the uh, garage sale. Oh, um, no. which, which I followed online and was so upset because there were some awesome posters and some really cool things. Is, is there anything left? Will there be another garage sale or did I just miss out on that? Uh, we saved a few things, but some of the best stuff got kicked up just so, so quickly. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you collect as much stuff as we have and you have a basement that can like just you know, things can be dumped into or a balcony that dumped onto then you're you realize how much stuff you've saved and you know a lot of it's um ephemera memorabilia that type of stuff and like you know sorry you were we missed it you weren't the only one we had people calling us saying can, can i buy it over the phone yeah you know, can i can you put it can you put it aside for me can you ship it that's awesome so it's great yeah for the jawheads that uh, can't get out to the music box theater but want to support the music box, where's the best place to guide them online for the virtual cinema and all that good stuff? Uh, just musicboxtheater.com. Simple. Do it, Jawheads. It is Charlize Theron month, and I know you're a fan, Ryan, of Charlize Theron. So if I put you on the spot here and take away Monster and Mad Max, because a lot of people are giving us those two as their favorite performance and favorite Charlize Theron film. Take those two away. What's your favorite Charlie Theron film? I don't know. I mean, those two, you know, are like her two, like, um, swings of her abilities as an actress, um, you know, both in, in genre and both in dramatic performance. I was pretty surprised with, what was that film that she did where she was uh, the mom in, and it was like the domestic household and she, yeah. um, and it was very raw performance. T um, Tolly? Tolly? Yeah, that, yeah, that was it. That's a I good she pick. I was really, really good in that. I really did. I, I was, I was actually, well, I was more surprised by how it was written and directed, but she, she definitely carried that film. Oh, I agree. And just like Monster, a brave performance because you think of Charlize Theron and, and she's a looker, right? She's, she's a knockout. She's like a bombshell blonde, and she's taken these roles that a lot of women might be shy to take, where she plays ugly. 
you know, like Monster. And like Tully, she's not afraid to just kind of let it all hang out in that movie. Uh, it was a good performance for sure. I like that pick. Agree. I like that one as well. Moves us on to our review here, Matt. Going back a few years, I used to refer to Dave Franco as the throwaway Franco. He seemed to be latching on to his brother's fame and not someone that I thought would cut out a career for himself. He's proving me wrong. Fun stints in Neighbors and Warm Bodies, major roles in Now You See Me and The Disaster Artist, and now his directorial debut, The Rental. Is The Rental worth a rental or better yet, a trip to the Music Box Theater? Matt and I fired up our Airbnb app to rate it. Carly! Tell me that's not a camera. Get through the night. We leave first thing in the morning. What's going on? I, I don't know. The premise is simple. Two couples are going to a vacation home for the weekend. It should be a fun getaway at an amazing property, but things go horribly wrong. The couples are connected. For starters, Josh and Charlie are brothers, but there's another connection. Charlie, the older brother, works with Mina, who is the younger brother's girlfriend. Hmm, wonder if something's happening here. With all that thrown in on the campfire, you would think we have enough, but there's more. The house they rent has cameras inside watching the couple's every move. When things go wrong between the couples, the idea that someone taped it all, that just makes everything that much worse. This is a short, tight thriller clocking in at 86 minutes. There are a few dark scenes outside in the woods, so I suggest seeing this in a dark room or in a theater. For a first feature, I was impressed. He did not go for anything bombastic, But Dave Franco gave us an easy movie to enjoy on a summer weekend and a reason to double think your next Airbnb trip. Matt, have you ever used Airbnb and your thoughts on the rental? I have not ever used Airbnb. It seems creepy. And and this movie is is, uh, cements that feeling in, in me. And I have to say, the rental was all right. The thing about the rental is that even with Joe Swanberg and Dave Franco writing, a couple of indie darlings, there is not a whole lot of originality here. As soon as the sex and drugs begins, the whole thing devolves into a barely inspired slasher flick. If it had let the slow dread of being watched build or the guilty conscience of the two characters fester, that might have created a tenser atmosphere more pregnant with dread. Instead, it leaves the lights on figuratively and poorly times every wannabe jump scare predictable front to back while i did enjoy the killer's mo probably the best part of the movie it's not revealed until after the credits roll this latest masked killer is generic and his kills are underwhelming if you're going to make a movie like this one that contains an injured woman screaming as she limps through a foggy wood with a killer hot on her trail at least give me some good gore Sadly, the rental blows it in that department as well. The rental straddles two genres and topples off a murky cliff. The ending was kind of good, but the journey was not worth it, Ryan. Wow. Wow. I I think the creepy factor is twofold. One, the idea of being watched. And I I do agree with you. I don't think they let that stretch out long enough. No, um, it, not at it, it's, all. It, it's sort of brought up and then it's revealed and it's, it's you know, creepy, but I, I think it could have been drawn out a little bit more. However, the other element that you're not giving us is, is the guy that they rent the house from is, is just off, right? And, and they could <laughs> misread him. And probably the creepiest moment is when, when the couples first arrive at the house, they mention how 
they wish they'd brought their telescope from the city. They leave to go for a walk, and, and in passing with this guy that they're renting the house from, and he's going to take off and leave, he says, oh, I'll bring you a telescope. But they don't really think he's going to bring it, or maybe they're going to call. Well, they come back from their walk, the telescope's back in the house. I thought that was the, the weirdest moment. Like, what, is this guy going to keep coming in and out of the house? Really? That's what you, that's what you oh, thought yeah. was weird? Yeah. Listen, I saw the whole thing with him coming a mile away, a mile okay. away. I, I've rented Airbnb. I've done Airbnb. And I'm definitely, the first time I did it, I went through, you know, the person's drawers and everything, looking around. Did you find any hidden cameras or anything? No, but I, you know, decent drugs. But oh, stash of porn, maybe? <laughs> but, but overall, it's, it's, it's interesting, like, what you would do when you're in someone's house and, and you have that moment, like, yeah, this is sort of weird. I guess, but I think that that has worn off because Airbnb has been around for, uh, geez, I mean, getting close to a decade now. People are used to the whole idea of it. And the people that rent out their houses time and time again, they've almost become like little mini bed and breakfasts. They're very compartmentalized. I, I read an article where Dave Franco said, think about how weird it is. Like we're creeped out by so many things in this world, but for some reason, somebody gives uh, a house a, a few stars on an Airbnb app and we're all gung ho like, oh yeah, we should stay here. It's creepy to stay at someone else's house. And I think that mo this movie brought that up. And, and Yes, yeah, and that's all it did. Yeah, it's been around for a long time, but it had me thinking the next time I go to an Airbnb, I'm going to think of the movie The Rental. Yeah, fine. I, I agree. I said that right at the beginning. That's the, the MO of this killer. And I don't want to spoil it, but, but the Airbnb model plays into his MO. And that was the best thing about this movie. And it's a post-credits thing that gets revealed. It's a good ending. And I really enjoyed that. Do I want to see a sequel of this? No. The killer was bland. They didn't do enough of that you're being watched stuff. And then when two of the characters have do something that they feel very guilty about having done uh, and the killer kind of has the goods on them that doesn't even get stretched out satisfactorily. It's just, there's so much opportunity and so much potential in this movie and it's just squandered. And you know how I like to say, I really like when horror says something about society. This could have said a lot about voyeurism. It could have said a lot about infidelity or something like that. There's a lot of things it could have said. And it doesn't. It, it devolves into that I'm being chased through the woods by a killer with an axe kind of thing. And it just falls flat on its face, just like the girl falling over a log in the woods. It's done before. Well, we, we have to mention the year of Dan Stevens continues. Uh, I loved him as the Russian in Eurovision. And yes. I commented about him there. I agree. And he He plays the older brother here. And he's very effective here as well. So... I'm all on board with this Dan Stevens suddenly. I, 100%. I love Dan Stevens. The, the cast is good in general. I agree. But again, this is a directorial debut. I, I think for a first effort, pretty solid. I disagree. Mm -hmm. I think it was not pretty solid. You got a movie poster quote for me? I do. <laughs> you're going to love this. Ever feel like you're being watched? Then you must not be the rental. Get it? Get it, Ryan? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's weak. Like no, it's usual. not. It's good. Yeah. I, I went pretty right on the nose as I was talking about. For a directorial debut, Franco supplies plenty of thrills in the rental. I, I'm glad you like it. I'm glad we're split on this because we are trying to get people interested to, to go see this in the, at the music box. So, Jawheads, figure this one out for yourself. But I think everyone's going to agree with me in the end, Ryan. No, how, I don't think so. I don't, uh, I don't how many, think so. It's bland. How many jaws are you give this? It's at least two and a half jaws. Man, you're just throwing out jaws willy-nilly. No, what are you talking about? What are you giving this thing? It's one and a half jaws. Oh, no. It's, it's better than a one and a half no. jaw movie. I, if you were going to say two jaws, okay, mediocre. I wouldn't, but it's, it's, it's at least middle of the road. At least. Uninspired, predictable. There's no gore. It, there's, it, this wasn't scary. It wasn't scary. Creepy. That's the word I would use. It wasn't even creepy. creepy. It I was, thought it was creepy. I thought it was boring. You've never used an Airbnb. That's going to really change everything for me? I, think I could watch would. this movie at an Airbnb, and it still wouldn't be scary. I, now, I've done Airbnb a couple of times. Once by myself, actually, last year when I went to the Toronto International Film Festival, I did Airbnb by myself. And 
I walked around the whole place thinking, you know, like, well, just make sure everything's okay. Uh, you're always a little creeped out when you go into someone's house or apartment like that. I guess, yeah, get, and then get a this hotel. Movie got under my skin. Yeah, I don't know. All right, fine. Fair all enough. Right. Maybe, maybe it'll be scary for all the Airbnb fans out there. Okay. If you agree with me or you agree with Matt, shoot us an email, feedback at cinemajaw.com. Or if you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet at cinemajaw. That's what got us thinking with this uh, top five list. Voyeurism, since they have hidden cameras inside the house. And as I mentioned, there's a couple of big heavy hitters uh, that I think people already have uh, pop into their mind when they hear this topic. Ryan, uh, since you're our guest, was, was this an easy list for you to come up with? Or did you have to think about it a little bit? In the end, I had to think to finish the five. Um, I had like... I think it was three that just like boom, 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 just popped in my head. And I was like, yep, uh, these, these, this is like, this is where I want to be. Uh, and then I had to kind of like sit on it for a little bit to like kind of fish it, kind of finish it. And then it, it was funny because at the end I was like, oh, and then there, what, what about, there's some other ones that I could have probably put on there. But yeah, I got my, I got my five after a little while. All right. Well, what do you got sitting at five? You're kicking it off. It's a film that, at, um, we played at the Music Box two years ago when we were doing a Robin Williams uh, tribute after his uh, passing. Yes. Yes, and yes. it's a, it, I always wanted an excuse to show this film because um, it's really dark and it's very different for Robin Williams. And the movie is called One Hour Photo. It's from 2002. Uh, it's by a director by the name of Mark Romanek, who you probably know or or have seen one of his music videos because he's been making music videos since the 1980s and he's worked with like huge talent you know from like the Rolling Stones to Nine Inch Nails to like Lenny Kravitz I mean this this guy has made tons of music videos um and worked with a lot of big big folks and has done a lot of different stylistic stuff and it's always interesting when you see a music video director go into uh, feature-length filmmaking man one hour photo got under my skin i mean just in all the right ways because it's quiet and it's foreboding and you you don't know what's coming and robin williams plays not robin williams i mean he is so mute and just like thinking and you know but he's also got this sort of intensity to him i remember there's just this one sequence that's just terrifying that totally um to me just like it just it sets this build up of this film and then you see the sequence and even though it's like kind of like a surrealistic moment the um, eyes bleeding the eyes bleeding scene yeah yeah uh it's freaky yeah and then and then the film starts its third act um and so yeah one hour photo uh definitely for for voyeurism that 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 was a good way to start this list great pick i love one hour photo uh that swings it over to me at number 5 I have an actual scary movie, uh, Ride the Movie Guy, that, that sort of used voyeurism in a way I think we all think about, right? When you have a security camera, this has been used in so many movies, and you just happen to catch a snip of something, you're like, what the hell was that on the camera screen, you know? Uh, that whole concept was expanded in paranormal activity. Generated a slew of sequels to greater and lesser returns, but the original film, quite original, in, in its execution. It was the standard Ouija board haunted house thing, but shown through a new perspective of the, the camera um, that was sort of capturing these moments and allowing the audience to be voyeurs. It's, I guess, a bit of a piggyback on the Blair Witch Project and the found footage genre, perhaps, but I think it's also a little bit more than that. It's a terrifying, terrifying film. Great ending, too. How many have you seen? I have seen... I think only the first one. I've seen at least three. I've seen up to the one with the little girl. And I've I seen, think I've seen three. Is that the third one where it's yeah, the little girl and she's talking to an imaginary friend, which that creeps the hell yeah. out of me. Yeah. I'm but so yeah, glad I, I, none of my kids I, have an imaginary but, friend. But I think there's like five or six and I'm just oh, like, yeah. I'm, I stopped after a while. There's only certain horror franchises that I will just keep going with and paranormal activity. I was like, okay, I got it. Yeah, I'm going to throw it in the jaw box to see how many there are. Because you're right, I, I lost track after four, but I think there's five or six also. I think you're right. There might have even been spinoffs like Paranormal Activity Miami, you mm. know. So swings it over to my number five. And I just want to say, for, for the first two picks here, especially this first pick, it, it's really not that great of a film. But I realize while I'm in quarantine that 
I've actually been looking for what Matt, you would call schlock uh, sometimes. Uh, for instance, I was looking for like, just sort of like a dumb, big action film uh, that I, I hadn't seen. I caught up with The Last Action Hero. This was a blind spot for me. That was one. I rewatched John Carter. Uh, I don't know why, but I was drawn to watching <laughs> something that was somewhat crappy, you know? Like movie pop up when I was doing my research, and I remember seeing it, and at the time being really freaked out by this movie, but uh, I can't say it's all that great. But if you're in the, in the mood for a film like this, 1993, uh, the cast here was William Baldwin and Sharon Stone, the movie was Sliver. You guys see this movie? I have not. And I saw this pop yes. up a lot on my uh, research. So do, do enlighten us. Okay. Oh, please take me down that memory. <laughs> For starters, this was one of the early films to receive the NC-17 rating, do, doing research on, on the movie. And the studio did not want the NC-17 rating. But to go and get rid of the NC-17 rating, they were going to have to do reshoots. And they actually changed who the killer was uh, late, late in the process of making the movie uh, to get away from this NC-17 rating. But the idea here is that William Baldwin's character actually owns an apartment building that they call 113. And Sharon Stone is like a, a writer or an editor and she moves into the building. And she's told at the time that a lot of female tenants in this building have died some gruesome murders and they can't figure out who the killer is quite yet. Hmm. Well, it turns out William Baldwin's a creep. I mean, not just in real life, in the movie as well too. He ends up having every single apartment in the entire building on closed circuit TV. And there's a room where, and that's the freakiest part in this movie. You finally get the reveal of this room where you see all the TVs and all the different people and what they're doing in their apartment buildings. It's, it's a highly sexual film as well. Like I say, I, I looked it up on Rotten Tomatoes. It's sitting at, I think, 11% rotten. So I, I'm not recommending some great cinema here, but if you're in the mood for a, a decent thriller that uh, you can somewhat laugh with, I think, as times pass now, Sliver is the name of that one, 93. It's come recommended a lot on, uh, in my research, so... I'll check it out. It should not be recommended, but I just remember some good claustrophobic moments between walls with like people shimmying between walls. And I'm just, yeah, I'm not, I'm not recommending it to you, Cinema Jaw uh, listeners. I'm sorry. <laughs> so what you're saying is it's not going to be playing the 70 millimeter film fest at the music box. <laughs> it's never going to play the music box. <laughs> not on Ryan's watch. No. All right. No, that... no William Baldwin will touch my screen. <laughs> By the way, when do we start calling him William? It's Billy Baldwin, right? Yeah. I mean, he goes by William. Ugh, jeez. All right, yeah. that that swings it back over to Ryan Ostrike. What do you got sitting there at number four, Ryan? I kind of went literal with this, and uh, also I don't know that I love how sexual all voyeurism movies can become because I I feel like you know cinema really kind of messed up those connotation that all voyeurism has this erotic tension or is sexual, um, because a lot of voyeurism isn't. And that, and all all movies that are have that realistic tendency are voyeuristic in a sense of how we are even watching them. I'm not talking about big blow up spectacles. I'm thinking, you know, more like dramatic turns and that sort of stuff. Where you're kind of like trying to get a taste of real life without actually, you know, watching real life. Um, so this one I want I went with because um, it's literal voyeurism, um, but it's in David Lynch's head, and so it makes little sense, um, but you can make whatever sense you want, which is why I love David Lynch film. This is 1997's uh, Lost Highway, mm. which is a very, very intense film. Heavy uses of very loud goth rock with, you know, Marilyn Manson and, and Rammstein. But really it comes down to a man who is being videotaped by somebody else and he doesn't know this person and this person is sending him those videotapes. And so it's driving this person mad to try to figure out why somebody would be watching him and his wife. And then the story spirals into all of the transcendental meditative ways that David Lynch's brain works. Uh, and it becomes its own hallucinatory thing. And it's very complicated and whatnot. But the voyeurism is there at the beginning and it's very important. And then it just lets the movie go in its own way. But I really like this film uh, in the sense that you just sit there trying to figure it out, but you're also entertained or sucked in by it. you can't like take your eyes off this movie 
and then of course you can always argue with people whether it makes any sense. Um, it's always a, it's a good conversation. I, I think all David Lynch's are great conversation pieces, right? Sure. You yeah. Know, straight, straight story is a little bit quicker of a conversation, but the mm -hmm. rest of his movies, yes, absolutely. A good arguing arguments or conversations. Mm -hmm. Into my number four, and I've got one I know Rye the Movie Guy will approve of, The Burbs. Having grown up in the suburbs myself, I'm, I'm very familiar with that sort of picket fence, keeping up with the Joneses, peeking out your window at night to see what the neighbors are up to over there, you know? Uh, and that's very much on display in The Burbs. And it's, it's, first of all, it's hilarious. Tom Hanks, Bruce Stern, it's a farce. It's a, it's a parody we got Corey Feldman in there as well. Carrie Fisher as well, too. Carrie Fisher, right. But even though it's those things, it's also kind of realistic, right? For anybody who's grown up in the suburbs, we know that like the entire universe is located on one cul-de-sac. And everything that's happening in the world, a microcosm exists right in your own backyard. And, and uh, lo and behold, the Clopex move next door and they're monsters. So, uh, And that's only discovered through some good old fashion spying on your neighbor's style voyeurism in that spying that they're doing comes one of tom hanks's greatest lines and that's when um the clopex the, the garage door finally opens and the young clopex uh comes out uh, malachi from children of the corn yeah he comes out of the car he only goes down the driveway and then he takes the garbage out of the car and puts it into the trash can and and bangs it with a stick and, and hanks uh says i've never seen that before i've never seen that I've never seen anybody drive their garbage down to the street and bang the hell out of it with a stick. On. I've never seen that. I've never seen a man drive his garbage down to the end of the driveway and bang the hell out of it with a stick. <laughs> I love yeah, it. I mean, and the voyeurism's right at the, the center of this, right? Because by the end of the movie, when everything's going bananas, Corey Feldman's like sitting up on the roof ordering pizza, just watching everything unfold in front of him. So, mm. yeah. Yep. Got it from the pizza dude. And, and that's a over... film that actually has played and could play again, The Music Box. It is a very entertaining film. See, yeah. see, Ryan, I'm coming with the good picks. That, that one plays The Music Box. I'll be there. Uh, I, I love that one. My number four pick, I'm getting better. This one's still not great cinema by any means, but it's better than uh, Sliver. And this is a, a horror film. Maybe Matt's seen this one. I, I came across it on one of the streamers and thought it was decent. But when you're talking voyeurism it, it creeped me the heck out uh 2007 kate beckinsale and luke wilson in the movie vacancy yeah see this is what i'm talking about dude you mean the, the the prototype for the rental the rental is airbnb this is a motel a creepy oh, sleazy geez. motel but it, they're completely different buddy yeah, they weren't in a cabin, they were in a tent. It's completely okay. different. But get this for the premise. Their, their car breaks down. They have to, to walk back to this like motel. It's, it's dingy, it's creepy, but all right, they need a place to stay. They're in this room and uh, Luke Wilson, and, and they're on the fritz. They're about to get like a divorce. So nothing's going good for this couple. And uh, Luke Wilson sees these uh, VHS tapes on his TV in the, the room that they got. And he puts this uh, tape in the VCR and he starts playing it. And it turns out to be a snuff film that was made in the room that they're staying. So they're completely creeped out. They end up hearing like somebody come to the hotel who they think might be able to save them. But that guy's actually there to buy snuff films from the motel guy who that's his whole business is to make snuff films in these various rooms. And eventually they find like a trap door that leads back into where the hotel manager would be. And there again is that reveal, much like in Sliver, uh, a wall of TVs and each room is being videotaped. Oh, that, that kind of stuff creeps me the hell out. Decent horror, decent. It's, it's a little far-fetched. It gets away from the director here. I, I don't think the movie quite completes the creepiness of the premise, but if you're looking for a, a thriller, it's decent. I agree. I think it's much better than... The rental, frankly, but you just you're just not gonna let that go. I'm not. Um, well, I'm gonna put vacancy down as a as something to watch. That's gonna go on my list. Thank you. There you go. Uh, into our threes. Going my uh, kind of art house road, uh, you know, classics. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, the Italian director uh, Michelangelo Antonioni's Blow Up, which is uh, it's just a, it's a really great film in itself. With John that, Travolta, right? 
No, that no, that's uh, Blow Out. Oh, Blow Out. Okay. Yeah. So Blow Out was a remake of Blow Up, oh. um, but it was it was done differently because it was done with sound in Blow Out. Blow Up is done with um, a photographer. Uh, for those who are familiar with Blow Out, it's very. It, you just basically put you put this in in London in the swinging sixties. Uh, so it's a, it's a it's a critique of you know the, the the culture of that time, and also you give the man a camera, and he he's in the wrong place at the wrong time, or at the right time, but he also is a little too nosy, um, and he kind of gets his camera in the wrong you know kind of a little close up, and uh, he captures something that he doesn't know what it is until he realizes. Um, that he should look closer at the at the photos, like blow it up more and more, and then he realizes that he's in the middle of a thriller where kind of like a whodunit and what's going on, and it, it, it then it becomes kind of like more of like a, a plot driven movie. But in its beginnings, it's very much stylistic and it's kind of cr critical of the time, and it's beautifully directed. Antonioni is a, an incredible filmmaker who really kind of likes to try to look at the culture of the time, um, and then th in this one, he was really looking at London. But if you like Blow Out, I would absolutely recommend Blow Up because they are also very different films. Also, if you like Blow Out, you should watch The Conversation because that's another voyeuristic, really great film using sound. So I would recommend Blow Up. Perfect. I'm going to throw that in the job box, see if it's streaming anywhere. I, I might give that one a watch this week. Yeah, voyeurism doesn't have to be about being watched, Ryan. Sometimes it can be about being listened to. Mm, this is true. Over to me. And before I, Ryan Ostrike said, you're not going to let this go, and I'm not, because before vacancy and before no. the rental. Oh, no. What? You, no. you don't know you're where You're just I'm going, going on. Yeah, you're just going on and on. Right. But it all started. It all started with Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, the creepy motel, the somebody's watching you in your room thing. It all got started with Hitchcock. It all got started with Psycho. Everything that happens leading up to the motel. She steals the money. She, she's driving away. She gets there. She, she thinks she's safe. And then you see, you know, Norman looking through peepholes. It doesn't have that, um, that big reveal of a room full of TVs because this was way before something like that was technologically feasible for a small hotel owner, motel owner. But it does have some of the most disturbing imagery that to, even to this day still holds up in horror. The shower scene alone, I think, is one of the, the best things ever committed to film, period. The use of sound in that movie, I can go on and on. But the voyeurism, because he's, he's stunted sexually, right? And he, he is a voyeur in, with, with sexual intent, at least to some degree. But his development has been stunted in that place because of his relationship with his mom, his twisted relationship, uh, who's dead, as we come to find out later. It's just oh, it's such a great movie. And, this, and the looking through the peepholes and all the little hidden vantage points done so well by the, in the hands of a master like Hitchcock. No doubt. No doubt. There That's you go. one of those that I, I was talking about, the new uh, streaming service, Peacock. That's one of the Hitchcock films that's on there for free. So Yeah, you sold me with that. There you go. Yeah. Um, great pick. Yeah, Thanks. for sure. Glad that one came up. My number three uh, is a film with a pretty large cast that came out in 2018 another hotel movie one of the better hotel movies fun the cast i i'm referring to includes jeff bridges chris hemsworth dakota johnson john ham and cynthia arrivo i'm speaking of bad times at the el royale this is one of those fun movies where we get to see each character's perspective of the same night so you're seeing the events um, unfold from, from each character's uh, perspective and what they were doing leading up to meeting that other character, uh, maybe in the lobby or so forth. And the voyeurism happens um, the first time we see it with John Hamm's character, who is actually an FBI agent, which we don't know when he, when he first checks into the hotel. But he ends up, he's looking for these old wiretaps that the FBI had put in this room that he's staying in. And he's trying to collect those. And when doing that, comes across a, a corridor in the hotel that basically goes around all the rooms. And you can look into each room through a two-way mirror. So he sees that one, but then later the actual hotel worker, uh, the manager who's checking them all in, ends up showing Jeff Bridges' character 
the same thing. And at different times, John Hamm, when he's looking through there, actually thinks he's seeing like a kidnapping happen. And then later, Jeff Bridges and this hotel worker, he's showing him the corridor and they see something else take place uh, in one of the rooms. And it, it all leads up to this mass confusion. Could have been a great movie, but I think that the last act of the film was a bit of a letdown. Uh, and that was when Chris Hemsworth actually comes on screen. But boy, was it a fun movie in general. I think most people would have a, a kick out of this one. Hey, have you caught up with this one yet, Matt? No, no. I'm putting it on my list as uh, one I need to catch up with. Yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I've had multiple people say you would really like this movie. Mm, it's a good one. It's a good one. Bad Times at the El Royale was my number three. Into our twos we go. All right. Well, I'm going to stay with uh, some European filmmakers. Um, I'm going to go with uh, a 2006 German film by a filmmaker, Florian von Donnersmark. I think it actually won the Oscar for Best Foreign Language Film that year. It's called The Lives of Others. And the reason this film is just so fucking good, it's, it's loosely based on real events. And the Cold War and East Germany uh, or just in general, the Soviet Union, they spied on each other. They spied on their own citizens. And I mean, they did it to an intense level of, you know, like where you as a person could have this real paranoia because you know you're being spied on or you know there's a potential being spied on because you know other people are being spied on or you know that the Stasi is out there spying on people and they really exist. And so, you know, this is a, a, this crazy kafka look and how that society was working in that time of the 80s at this height of over paranoia and being surveilled and then watching this actor show his like occupation as somebody who spies on other people right and it just takes you down this road and um you, it just it, it envelops you and you're you're you you can't look away from it it's a beautifully made film yeah, I would just highly recommend it to anybody who hasn't seen it. I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to ruin anything. Yeah. Um, but it's, this this I was the recommend it. This was the Academy Award winner for best foreign film that I year. I believe so in yeah. two thousand six. Yeah, yeah I, I believe you're right. Um, I'm a big fan. I, I have brought it up on the jaw a couple of times. Yeah, big fan of that one. Do do check it out. The lives of others, Matt. All right. At number two, in all honesty, I also had one hour photo. So I'm gonna call a quick audible. I was going to throw in vacancy here, Ryan, but you, you snatched that off of my list. So I'm going to go with one I don't think you guys have, just so we don't cross over. And go ahead and say 1984, the adaptation of the, the famous novel. I don't know as a movie if it can possibly live up to that amazing book, but it's, I think it's a pretty damn good movie. It's more about surveillance than, than voyeurism, but I suppose surveillance and voyeurism are kind of like cousins in a way I don't, I don't know how to explain that but they're very similar and i don't think i need to really wax poetic on 1984 everybody's very familiar yeah i i, I have not seen the movie and in, in fact i had the conversation with you when i i had just recently read the book now i say just recently but probably six years seven years ago but i remember asking you i was finishing up the book and i said oh now i'm gonna watch the movie and you were sort of mixed you're like eh, you don't have to watch the movie if you've read the book <laughs> The but movies, I do remember John Hurt's performance right. being really good. That's true. Like, I think he, he really pulled that film through a lot, even if at times he was asked to do really tough things for the movie mm -hmm. um, because they actually, they asked him to go in a lot of emotional ways. Um, and you're right, that is an impossible model to, to fully adapt. Um, but man, uh, John Hurt, if I, if I recall, the last I haven't seen it in years, it was really good. It's been a while since I've seen it too, but John Hurt's performance sticks in my mind. You're absolutely right. It was a damn good one. Yeah. When, when you first said 1984, I thought you were just saying the year. Oh, the and year. Then, and then you were going to say the movie is Revenge of the Nerds because there is some voyeurism there. What's funny is John Hurt got to sort of turn that on its heel in V for Vendetta and be sort of the big brother character when he was the, the chancellor or whatever that character's name was of mm -hmm. England. Mm -hmm. Um, my number two, this is probably um, the most outside the box pick that I have for voyeurism. But I think once I give it to you, you guys will agree. If Matt has ever caught up with this one yet, I still don't know. But 2013, sci-fi film, a thriller, has to do with voyeurism. It's damn good. If you haven't seen it, please do. 
Scarlett Johansson in Under the Skin. This is obviously she plays an alien. Um, people probably know this, but it's really focusing on like an alien's perspective of the human world. So you have this sort of not necessarily voyeurism, but at least an observation standpoint of this alien observing the human race in general, and especially single men. But where the voyeurism comes in, and I pulled this excerpt from uh, Wikipedia, was really about the production of the movie. Uh, it was directed by Jonathan Glazer. And most of the cast uh, was chosen from applicants without previous acting experience. Many scenes were filmed with hidden cameras as Glazer wanted the film to feel realistic. Most characters played by non-actors, many scenes such as those set at nightclubs, shopping center, and the scenes in which Johansson's character picks up men in the van were unscripted sequences filmed all on hidden cameras. The production team would then inform the subjects that they had been filmed, asked permission to use the footage that they had just filmed. Glazer said the men were talked through what extremes they would have to go through if they agreed to take part of the film once they understood what this project was all about. I remember seeing this in the theater and just having that feeling like you're talking about movies in general being a, a, a sense of voyeurism to them as we're watching these characters. But this really did, uh, especially those scenes in the van, you could just tell that these people did not know they were being part of a movie when this was actually being filmed. And it wasn't was probably told to them until after, but it, right. it worked to great effect because you could just feel that. And I didn't know that going into the movie, but just as a viewer, you just knew you were watching something that was off, uh, that you were spying on these guys, if you will. It's, it's creepy. That is weird. No, I still have yet to catch up with it. Uh, I really, really want to. So yeah, I it's love the under list. the skin. I've actually only seen it that one time. Uh, Ryan, you a fan of this one? This film just annihilated me. I was blown away. I saw it a couple of times that year that it came out within the month that it was released. I played it at the movie theater I was running at that time. And um, yeah, this thing is just like a, a complex but simple uh, film that you feel like watching once is not enough to really kind of appreciate everything that's going on. In it. And that, I just remember the sound, the score in that movie mm -hmm. was haunting too. And Scarlet was really good. Yeah, that film. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that, and that room, yeah, that yeah. room that she would take the men to. Yes. So, that, oh my God, it's so that creepy. Black, vacuous <laughs> room where you just don't know what's gonna happen, but it's it's it pulls you in in a way that's that it shouldn't because there's nothing there, other than their bodies. Yeah, I I, I highly recommend Under the Skin. Yep. It's really good. My number two that leaves us with our our number ones. By the way, Ryan's been picking his top five list. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say we might have the same number one. I'll just ask Ryan, is, is, your, is yours a foreign film? Nope. Okay. Okay. No. Nope. Uh, but I'd be shocked if I don't have a same one as somebody. Uh, just because for me, this was the... Back with seeing movies and, 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 and voyeurism as like, like the integral piece of what the movie is. And that's a nice paper, uh, film uh, by Alfred Hitchcock called Rear Window. Um, and I mean, this is the whole, the whole damn movie is Jimmy Stewart basically spying on his neighbors because he is uh, it's broken leg and he's stuck in his room and he has nothing to do. And he's got this strange courtyard uh, set up with where, where the apartments are all. And he's got this telescopic lens uh, with his camera because he's a, he's a cameraman. So that just basically fits. I mean, this is total Hitchcock in the way that this film is constructed. It's so brilliant. Um, and he becomes a peeping Tom. And he knows what he is doing. He's, like, incredibly aware that he is, he is a peeping Tom. But he can't help himself. He just pull. He, 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 he just gets wrapped up into these other people's lives. And then, of course, in a very Alfred Hitchcock way, it becomes a, a, a murder mystery. And it's a thriller. It's got really great suspense. And of course, it's got great uh, dialogue, and they're uh, you know it's really well written characters. Grace Kelly, thank you, Grace Kelly. Like, it's the female lead; she's freaking amazing, and I love their banter back and forth. I had to go back to what I thought of as like really early on uh, a voyeurism film, and Rear Window. That was like like when you guys asked me what what my top five was the first thing that popped in my head was Rear Window and I knew it was going to be my number one just because it's so really well constructed. And honestly, I wanted to be meta 
about this. And so for the garden movies, which the garden, the way the garden is laid out with the screen, you look at the screen and the screen is on the back wall of the garden. And then if you were to look above the screen, you're actually looking into apartments and like brownstone homes. So if you were really just to stare off, you, you might be looking into other people's windows. So for the garden movies coming up in a couple of weeks, I am going to show your window <laughs> at the music box. To see if anybody nice. picks up on that little oh, detail. <laughs> I think they're going to. I um, love it. But yeah, we're, your window you have to go back and watch if you, if you really want to think about voyeurism and just commentating on voyeurism even though hitchcock is commentating a lot of things in that movie hmm. so. great pick i figured it would be a number one on somebody so it, it, it was, is not my number one it is my number one in all honesty i also had rear window i think when you're talking voyeurism movies like like ryan said it is the creme de la creme i mean it really is tough to beat but if i have to throw a quick honorable in just to sub one out, I would throw a documentary up since we haven't had one. Citizen Four, the Edward Snowden documentary. Uh, and you could probably pair that with the Joseph Gordon-Levitt Snowden film, which wasn't that good, but at least gives a dramatization of what happens in the documentary. And it's about the surveillance of the American people by, by our government. Everything you were talking about that happened in the, the film about the Cold War in Russia may have or did happen in this country as well. And it's very creepy. And it's the kind of thing that makes you want to put a post-it note over your camera when you watch it. So that's just a quick honorable. What do you got at number one, Ryan? So I, I heard Ryan rattling off these foreign films as, you know, I thought, oh man, maybe we were going to have our, our same number one. Because in 2005, I, I saw this film and I was not familiar with the director, Michael Henneke at the time. But he gave us, I think, uh, right up there, uh, with Rear Window. I'm not even kidding you on, on mm. how great this film is. It's a bold, gave bold us statement there. Caché, which the only time I, I think I've talked about this movie on Cinema Jaw before is when we, we talked about great openings, uh, and this is a long time ago. And this movie opens with a five-minute stagnant shot of a, a, a house, like an apartment uh, complex, and the credits are basically playing over that. So as you start the movie, you think you're just watching like a, a set picture with the credits rolling. Once the credits are done, you get maybe another minute of that stagnant shot. And then uh, the camera pulls back. And what you realize is it's a, a man watching a videotape that's been sent to him of a surveillance of his house. And he has no clue who sent him this video. And that's how the movie starts. And he keeps getting more of these. And he doesn't know who's filming him or why. And this character is uh, riddled with guilt, had a question of brain and things that happened in childhood. So he goes down that road, uh, assuming that maybe it's, it's this person uh, seeking some type of revenge on him. Um, again, voyeurism, just a, the whole creepy factor of who's watching you and why. It, it can drive you nuts. Uh, and it does this particular man and family as well. H have you seen this one, Ryan? Yeah, definitely re highly recommend Couché. That was actually on my honorable mentions. I don't know. I just, for some reason, didn't want to stay, stay to do too many European films. Um, mm -hmm. And I was really kind of enjoying kind of going back in, in, in movie history with my list. But um, sure. for those for those who uh, don't mind sitting down and watching a complex, you know, well-directed French movie, Jesus, Couché will surprise you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really, really good. Um, that was my number one. Quick honorable mentions before we go to break here. Rear Window, obviously, was the inspiration for Disturbia, which was Shia LaBeouf. But don't sleep on that one. It's actually a fun, uh, watered-down version of Rear Window. The Truman Show, where we're, we're all spying in on Truman. Mm, yeah. Um, and American Beauty has a, a little element there of voyeurism. Yeah. Uh, the, you, the, you just took a few off of my list. The only one uh, that hasn't been mentioned of mine would be Natural Born Killers, sort of the voyeuristic nature of the media, and Ex Machina. I think that there's a bit of a, a voyeurism thing going on in that as well. Those are, those are the only two I have that weren't mentioned. I would also recommend uh, Sex, Lies, and Videotape. Oh, yes. Yeah, perfect. I have not seen that. I have not seen that yet. Got to write that one down. I haven't seen it since the 90s, but I have seen it. It's been a long time. Yeah. It's one of those that you don't really think about. You, you do watch it because it's like part of that, you know, early indie wave of filmmakers and films that were 
kind of making making independent movies uh, talk talk of the town again, right? Um, it can be easily forgotten, but it actually it still it still holds up. It's really it's a really well crafted uh, drama. But a really great list, guys. I uh, yeah. wrote right. a couple of down that I need to go back and watch. Back at you. If we missed your favorite movie about voyeurism and you have Twitter pulled up, shoot us a tweet, or you can always email us, feedback at cinemajot.com. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we have a review of First Cow, plus Matt takes Ryan on in First Movie Trivia. Stick with us. Hey, Jawheads. It's no secret that there was a time when my kids were very young that I just didn't see as many movies as I should have. So we're thinking about creating a segment called Matt Catches Up, in which I give my quick thoughts on a movie that Rye reviewed on a previous episode. It might sound a little something like this. Back in 2017, on episode 321, Ryan reviewed a movie called Colossal. Well, I finally caught up with it. Jason Sudeikis and Anne Hathaway star in this quirky and very different sci-fi dramedy. It tackles issues like alcoholism and responsibility. It's different, it's funny, it's also a little serious at times, and I really enjoyed it. If you're looking for something that is off the beaten path, a little bit different, then I also recommend you catch up with Colossal if you haven't seen it. If you have seen it and you enjoy it, let us know what you think. Write us feedback at cinemajaw.com and give us your thoughts. Also, we did a really funny YouTube video on this one that you should definitely check out on the Cinema Jaw YouTube channel. That's pretty much what it would sound like, so if you think this is a segment we should do from time to time, let us know. are back on Cinema Jaw, hanging out with the general manager of the Music Box Theater, Ryan Ostrike. And Ryan, one thing I did not ask you, uh, there's a lot of concerned moviegoers out there when they do return uh, to the movie theater, what precautions, uh, safety measures that you're taking to put everybody at ease so that we can get lost in film. That's what we want as moviegoers. Uh, So what are you doing over at the Music Box to make sure we're all safe while we're watching our films? Well, first thing first, for anybody who is comfortable to try to come out again, great. And if you're not, don't worry about it. Don't push yourself. This is not a you have to come back to the movies. But if you are comfortable coming out um, or if you have a safe way to travel to the music box, you know, like your own vehicle or something like that, then you should come out. But know, know two things. Know what we're doing and know what we ask you to do because this is a, this is a social contract we're making with each other right now. So what we're doing is... We're enforcing all of our staff to wear masks at all times in the building. They, they cannot take their masks off uh, unless they go outside of the building and that's where they have their lunch break. Um, wearing gloves, washing hands, sanitizing everything. We take their temperatures. We ask if they've had any symptoms. I mean, basically there's just, we do not, we cannot have this, any, vi- any virus or anybody who's potentially sick inside our building. So we start with our staff first. Then we go to the next degree of how we can set up our space so that we will reduce, it's all about risk mitigation, right? And so how can you get this thing, you know, below 1% of, an, of a chance of anything even being in the, in the space whatsoever? And so socially distancing these seats, because they all say, like, if you can't have masks on, or if you're in proximity to each other, be six feet apart, right? So you can't be within six feet of each other. I mean, we have these lines, these markers, we when you come into the door, we, t- we literally tell you you cannot be within six feet of somebody else. So we're, we're, we're distancing people that way. We're also saying you, customer, when you come in, you have to wear a mask. Like we're at the door. We do not let you in unless you have a mask on. It's simple. I'll just say you can't not come in. That's it. I'm just not letting you in. A mask is what is important. And then we ask you to keep your mask on uh, while in, in, the, in the building at all times unless you're eating and drinking um, popcorn. Also remember, movies watching is very passive. The biggest concern that people are having is eating, dr- eating like you know, like at a restaurant, talking loudly, or at a bar. Think about shouting, singing, all that kind of stuff, and being within like close proximity. 
going is really passive. You're sitting in your seat, socially distanced from other people, wearing your mask, right? And you're not talking, you're not doing anything. So you're already not in that space where it's very likely you're going to transmit it to somebody else. But then we went even a crazier step forward, farther than anybody that I know. And so what the CDC is recommending for HVAC systems, that's your heating, ventilation, and cooling, what they're recommending is 25% to have your economizer open. And what your economizer is, is it's your fresh air intake. And, you know, there's been, there's like, there was this study out of, not study, there was this report out of China that was like, oh, the virus got into the AC and then it recirculated back into the system, right? Now that's one specific study. And I don't know how big of an issue that really is across, across everything. But you know what? I'm going to take that thing really seriously. So I actually opened my economizer up 100%. So there is zero recirculation of air. It cannot be recirculated. It is only fresh air or chilled air from the outside that is coming in, piping into the theater, and it's 100% fresh. So that's why people are more comfortable being outside if they don't have their mask on, because you have all of that fresh air. And all what that fresh air is doing is it's diluting the particles. So let's just say in the chance that you're near somebody outside who potentially is talking and breathing that particle on you, that fresh air is what you need to dilute that particle. So in the, in, in the small chance that you got it, it's already diluted and it's not potent enough to make you get the virus, right? So for me, even though I don't allow that to happen, you can't be sitting, you, you can't be talking to people that you don't know and you also are six feet apart. I still have 100% fresh air pumping into that room. And the great thing about that, other than, well, the bad thing is my electric bill is really high. The good thing is that when I open the doors, I pressurize that room. So when the movie ends, I open all the doors, including the ex emergency exit doors, and the room is pressurized. So basically all of the air blows out of the room. So any air that was nice. in there is now blowing out, and it's only being refilled by fresh new air. So for me, what I needed to do as a, as a responsible business owner was to take every way I can mitigate this risk. And I took it to the nth degree in every potential way. And so basically what I want my customers to know is that I'm taking this thing incredibly seriously. Um, and you could know that when you're coming in, what you're getting from me. And again, this is a social contract. What I'm asking of you is you can't come in if you're sick. You can't come in if you're not going to be willing to wear a mask. Um, and if we can all do these things then we can sit down and watch this movie and just be comfortable watching a movie and just get lost in the movie and not worry about the pandemic around us because that's what we need right now. We need yeah. movies to take us away from the shit that we're just right. living in. To, so, we need that escape. Yeah, you 100%. Fin 100%. You, you, you finally sit down and, and Ryan programmed Jim Carrey's The Mask. <laughs> <laughs> bad, bad joke, Ryan. Jesus. Real, real bad joke. Yeah, um, it's just like no, a lead but, balloon. We, we thank you for your professionalism and uh, your, your caring, Ryan. Um, we'll, we'll be out at the Music Box Theater. I will, to see a movie very shortly. All right, Matt, we did throw a couple items into the jaw box. And before we get to trivia and before we get to first cow review, let's open up that jaw box. What's your pleasure, Mr. Cotton? The box. We got a box! Uh, what's in the box? Right. Only two questions in here, Matt. The first one was... Paranormal Activity. How many films are there? Yeah. And uh, we wanted to know if there were up to five. Believe it or not, six. Six Paranormal Activities. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. One, two, three, four. And then there's two called, one's called Paranormal Activity, The Marked Ones. And the last one, which came out in 2015, is Paranormal Activity, The Ghost Dimension. They just, they're just really wringing that towel for every drop that's in it. Blow Up, the movie that Ryan mentioned, I looked up to see if it was streaming anywhere as far as free free with a subscription service. Uh, DirecTV has it streaming for free, available to rent as cheap as $1.99 on all the other platforms. Nice. Apple, Amazon. So you can rent it there as well. Sweet. That was everything. Let's close that job out. <laughs> Kelly Reichert is a director whose name has not come up enough on the jaw. I did review her last film, 2016's Certain Women. Well, she is back with a new one, and it is one of the best-reviewed movies of 2020. First Cow was released the first weekend of March. In fact, I was headed to see it in the theater the weekend the pandemic really hit, 
and I opted to stay home. Advice from Matt Kay. Well, A24, the studio behind it, pulled it out of theaters and had hoped to re-release it when things cleared. Well, after months of waiting, they finally have released it online. So Matt and I grabbed a glass of milk and checked it out. What's your name? King Lou. They call me Cookie. My mother died when I was born, and then my father died. I never stopped moving. It's the getting started that's the puzzle. No way for a poor man to start. You have a cow. First cow in the territory. It's ain't a place for cows. No, it's no place for a white man either. I sense opportunity here. Matt, my favorite Kelly Reichert film is Meek's Cutoff. You experience that film more so than you watch it. First Cow is similar in many ways. The film opens in modern day with a young woman and her dog making a discovery. We then flash back to the 1820s and meet Cookie, who is a cook for a traveling group of fur trappers. Cookie runs into King Lou, a Chinese immigrant who is on the run from Russians and is very kind to him. This act of kindness starts a friendship that is one for the ages. Eventually, Cookie and King Lou meet up again near an outpost. There, they hear that Chief Factor, a wealthy man in the settlement, is bringing up the first ever milk cow to the area. Cookie, being a cook, realizes how he could do some amazing baking if he was able to get his hands on some of that milk. A plan is hatched, and Cookie and King Lou start a makeshift baking business. Now, this may sound like a bizarre plot, it's very unique, but what also sets this film apart is the setting, attention to detail, and the patience Kelly Riker is able to apply to First Cow. This is a slow burn, and it will slowly cast a spell on you. I loved spending time with these characters and in this setting. I connected emotionally with them, and of course, in the last act, I really felt that emotion. First Cow is special. If you have not seen it, my advice is to make sure you watch it knowing it's slow paced. Your reward will be one of the best film experiences of the year. Matt, did you think the oily cakes was as tasty as I did? I did. I like those oily cakes, Ryan. A slow burn indeed, but one that is well worth it. Ryan's, I love a good palindromic movie and First Cow is a meditation on past lives that has a very satisfying palindromic effect. Friendship is, of course, the central theme. Cookie is this gentle man living in a brutal world, and King Lou, while perhaps not particularly a tough guy, has just enough strength to help Cookie begin to realize his dreams. While one might be able to suss out where things are headed for our duo as they watch, the beautiful sense of setting will carry you through. Every area the characters inhabit feels like it was plucked from a time machine from the muddy floors in the fort to the breezy evening in the Lord's house. First cow will place you on the frontier. I almost wonder if this will become a movie that startups and partnerships will watch because while there's some questionable ethics involved in their methods, there's also a great deal of courage in their doomed endeavor and one can't help but root for these two. I like this one a lot, Ryan. Yeah, I, I know this is almost going to sound uh, ridiculous, the way I'm connecting this, but when, when I was a, a kid, and I remember I asked my dad to help me and my friend make a clubhouse, mm -hmm. and it was going to be in like the back of my friend's house, and this idea that we were going to have our own little house in the backyard really excited me. We're, we're going to do this. We're going to have our own house. We're going to have a window right here, and we're going to put a flower plant right there. You know those kind of feelings I'm talking about? Of course. As a kid? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course it is. I almost forget those as an adult. You, you forget the, those kind of childhood thoughts sometimes. But didn't First Cow, in a lot of ways, bring back that, that kind of uh, excitement? Because not only in, in Cookie and King Lou's house, which the house itself is quite special. And, and later in the movie, we see something happen to that house. And I, I didn't think I could be emotionally moved by somebody doing something to a house, but I actually was. I, I could feel the emotions moving and I thought, oh my God, not only their house, but also the settlement and the idea of the frontier, the idea of them trying to sell these bakery goods 
basically on the ground in this rough, dangerous area that we are starting to see the idea of where a city might be uh, and who knows what would happen. I love those elements of First Cal. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, set, the, the time and the setting, that's really the magic in this movie. Cookie and King Lou's relationship is the, the other part of the, the magic of the movie, but without that setting, it's nothing. It's, they, they really place you there. They craft this world so beautifully. I mean, it's, it's not hard to do with some of the fantastic nature that they had to work with, but also like you're talking about the sets, the attention to detail and all the authenticity. It was great. And it didn't feel like a Western necessarily or a frontier movie. It just was, it just was. Mm-hmm. There, there's a great scene, obviously, they, they're going to have to milk this cow to get some, some milk. So no spoiler here, but, but probably in the hands of somebody else, that scene is, is more of a, a, a heist, uh, fast paced. But because this movie in general is, is a slow burn, slow paced, you get this almost Zen like moment where they first milk the cow Again, I was moved by that. I was really into that that moment. It was touching. There's an innocence to Cookie, right? That that's probably where you're getting those childhood feelings from, uh, Ryan. And and just so Ryan uh, O understands, Ryan the movie guy is a person whose inner child ran away a long time ago. <laughs> he's he's got the little stick with the with the bandana and all his. He ran away. So for it to touch Ryan the movie guy's inner child. <laughs> People, you have to know that this movie is truly special and to get that deep. Um, one element we haven't brought up, it's actually a funny movie. It, it's not like a laugh out loud Andy Samberg type film when I say that, but there, there's humor laced throughout the entire film. And a couple of the moments, there's, there's a bar fight in the movie that literally clears the entire bar because everybody's so enthralled to go outside and see this fight. I, I love that particular scene. And also when Cookie wears the boots for the first time into the outpost and everybody starts commenting on how nice his boots are. Yeah. Uh, I was laughing out loud at that. That was great. Yeah. They're almost like Wes Anderson-esque, really quirky beats to this to this movie. There's some really great details in the humor department. I agree. You got a movie poster quote for me? I do. It's a doozy. Ready? First cow is a heifer of a slow burn. Guess they really milked it. <laughs> Not bad, Matt. That's, that's one of your better ones. Yeah, that's definitely one of your better ones. Thank I you. went, uh, come for the cow, stay for the oily cakes. Nice. How many, how many jaws are you giving this? I'm going three and a half jaws. This is definitely one of the better films of the year. Yeah, that's, that's right where I landed too. Three and a half jaws. It is a slow movie. It's not for everyone. I'm sure a lot of people are going to be like, what the hell is this? It's not like, like bombastic entertainment. But if you're in the mood to sit down and just enjoy some atmosphere and some relationships, a bit of a character study, great movie. Yeah, I watched this just before, Matt. We were watching it basically on the same day, but I watched it earlier in the day. And when I saw the pacing, I texted you. Just because I knew you were going to watch it later at night, I think that helps listeners Watch it. You're much better probably if you have the time. Do it like on a, a weekend morning. I think you'll get the most out of it when you're relaxed and you could just sit there and take it in um, because it is. It, you need to be patient with the film and, and the reward is there. Trust me. Three and a half jaws for Matt K. A three and a half jaws for Ride the Movie Guy. Matt, I hear the music playing and that can only mean one thing. It's time to play some trivia. All right, in, all in right. Honor. In honor of First Cow, we are playing First Movie Trivia. It works like this, Ryan. You can choose if you want to go first or let Matt K go first. There are steals, and if you get hung up on any questions, you get one rescue. Rescue me, Ryan. I do have clues to all the questions. I will not go first. (laughs) I guess I'll be going first. All right, so Matt, you're going first? I'm going first. Okay, we're playing first movie trivia. Boy, I'm a little thirsty. Let me drink my, <laughs> my drink here. All right. Okay, I'm ready. Matt, your first question is this. Who played Neil Armstrong in last year's, in 2018's, I'm sorry, First Man? Um, that would be Ryan Gosling. That is correct. That is correct. One to nothing, Matt K., Question two, over to Ryan O'Strike. 
1982, Sylvester Stallone played John Rambo in First Blood. Who played Sheriff Will in the movie? I can see his face. Uh, no. Oh, what's his name? He has recently passed away. Yeah, it's like M. Emmett Walsh. No, that's not it. I don't know. Any guess? No? No. Oh, boy. We got to buzz him. Matt, you got uh, a chance for a steal here. I think we got to look back at the uh, at the tapes here and see for sure. But I'm pretty sure Ryan Ostrike has kicked my ass in trivia almost every time. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Maybe. Um, Brian Dennehy. That is correct. Brian Dennehy was the sheriff in First Blood. Two to nothing. Matt K. Wow. Question three is over to Matt. Matt Richard Gear played the character Lancelot one time in his career. It was in 1995 opposite Sean Connery. Name the movie. Oh, man. Okay, so, like, my knee-jerk reaction is to say First Night, K-N-I-G-H-T. Um, I'm not sure if that's correct, however. I know the movie. I know the movie. I've seen it. I'm going to go with that, First Night. That is correct. Wow. He is on a roll. Three to nothing, Matt K. Ryan, we need a strong comeback here, buddy. We'll see what happens. Question four is over to you. Adam Sandler starred in 50 First Dates opposite who? Drew Barrymore. There we go. He's on the board. He is on the board. It is three to one, Matt K. Question five is over to him. Matt, name the 1996 romantic comedy starred Goldie Hawn, Diane Lane, Bette Mittler, and one Sarah Jessica Parker. 19 what? What was the year? 19- what the hell? Yeah, yeah. 1996. First Wives Club. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Four to one. I didn't think you were going to get that one. All right. Four to one. Question six over to Ryan Ostrike. Ryan, in 2018, this actor starred as a pastor in the wonderful film First Reformed. Name the actor. Ethan Hawke. Ethan Hawke is correct. Four to two. Still a chance here. Question seven over to Matt K. Matt, talk yeah. about a romantic movie. In 1999, <clears throat> Val Kilmer plays a blind massage therapist. Oh, yeah. Falls in love with, with Mira, Mira Sorvino. Sorvino. Uh, dude, this is one of my favorite movies. What? <laughs> yeah, I love this movie. I mean, Val Kilmer and Mira Sorvino, hello, sign me up. That is at first sight. Yes, that is correct. <laughs> wow, wow. Um, wow. That- that is five. The last question in the game here, Ryan. But everybody, at least we could get all, all questions correct. Ryan, in 1995, Kevin Bacon plays an inmate at Alcatraz in the movie Murder in the First. Who plays the lawyer defending him? Kevin Bacon and who? All right, I... I... I want to say this woman's name, but I think it's a different movie that she is the lawyer in, so I'll take a hint. Well, your hint, for starters, it's a he. Okay, great. His, his initials are CS, and he was also in Young Guns, an interview with a vampire. Christian Slater. There we go. Five to three. Five to three. Matt does win this one. A virtual handshake. Yeah. Virtual handshake, sir. There we go. Well, no, good job. I started poorly, you know, and uh, that's what it, that's, you know, you got to come up guns blazing. Well, yeah, the, the, the Brian Dennehy question ruins you. There's no doubt. Yeah. I don't know why I just, just couldn't, couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, if it came down to a tie, a jawbreaker, this question would have been to Matt, actually. Better comic book movie, X-Men First Class or Captain America First Avenger? Uh, X-Men First Class. Is yeah, we better. give that yeah. to you. Yeah. X-Men First Class. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the real jawbreaker was this, Age of Mira Servino. 
Ooh, current, two. current yeah, age. Current age. Man, he's got a guess. What? He killed it. <laughs> Don't even take a guess, man. He just really? 52? Yes. Well done, wow. sir. Well done. She is an Oscar winner. What did Mira Sorvino win the Oscar for, Ryan? It was a Woody Allen film. Anybody? Uh, it was in the 90s, right? Uh, man, all of his movies blend in together with sometimes. Is it the like one Penelope? Mighty Aphrodite. Mighty, Mighty Aphrodite. Aphrodite, yeah. That's it. It was like 97, 98. Yeah, uh, and Penelope Cruz is in that as well, correct? Yeah, 1995. I don't think oh, she's in it. Oh, no? Okay. No. Yeah. Uh, I'm a huge Mira Sorvino fan. Romy and Michelle's <laughs> high school. Hey, listen. I, Summer I don't know. of Sam. Summer of Sam. Um, Lo- At First Sight with, with Val Kilmer. Uh, she's, she's been in a few others of that I really, really like. I just, I love her, man. She, I, she sort of dropped out for a little while, but I'm, I'm glad to see her name come up again and again lately. I'll be honest, when I was writing the trivia questions and I came across the movie, I wrote down and I thought, well, this will be the question that will stump everybody because no one's ever heard of this movie. But Matt's favorite. Who knew? I've probably seen it about at least a half a dozen times, maybe like eight to ten times. Oh, I was blind to it. Boom. There you go. <laughs> Brings us to the end of a great jaw. And first and foremost, got to thank Ryan for coming on. Staying up late with us. Uh, Thanks for coming on, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's just, it's great to jaw with you too and talk to to all your um, fans and listeners out there. I I do enjoy the podcast, listening to it myself. Thanks, man. Yeah, Yeah. thanks. Means a lot. We're going to continue to spread the good word about the music box and the reopening and all that good stuff. Thanks. And, oh, and there'll be more there. too. I mean, we're, um, you just have to pay attention to the music box. We're going to, we're going to do some drive-in movies too. Oh, nice. Ooh, I would see, nice. I will definitely be at a drive-in and I'll be in the, the theater as well. Pretty soon as well. Well, we'll, we'll get you in for some reason. Drive-in movie theater. Some, somehow we'll, we'll, we'll I don't know if I'll play at first sight, <laughs> but I'll get you in. Oh, uh, Matt, we also got to thank our sponsors. Yeah, thanks to Overcast and the Chicago Podcast Co-op who help us get great sponsors like them. Yeah, also thanks to Val Kilmer and Mira Savino for making At First Sight. And uh, for all the jawheads that uh, chime in on Facebook, uh, we are there uh, keeping the conversation going on our Facebook page as well, at Cinema Jaw. Yeah, and while you're at it, we're also on Patreon. It, it's patreon.com backslash Cinema Jaw. Until next week, I'm Rob the Movie Guy. I'm Matt Kay. And keep on jawing about the movies.